Two questions without notice, and I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, how many Australian families are currently on electricity hardship plans? The call to the Prime Minister. Every single household will get $300 of energy bill relief from today, Mr Speaker. They won't just get that, but every, every single Australian who is a taxpayer will get income tax relief, tax cuts that they oppose. Order. Pro order. Prime Minister will pause and I'll hear from the Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, on uh, relevance, to be fair to the Prime Minister, it's not every Australian, but it is 127,000 families the who are facing hardship at the, the moment. The member will return. Order. The Leader of the Opposition will just resume his seat. The Prime Minister has been asked a question. The Leader of the Opposition took the point of order. The Prime Minister has the call. The, uh, well, every single, every single person uh, that the uh, Leader of the Opposition just named will get energy price relief. <laughs> energy relief that they voted against, right. like they voted against the relief last year that we introduced in partnership with every state and territory government. Those opposite have opposed every bit of support that we have provided in cost of living relief. They oppose cheaper medicines. They oppose energy price relief. They oppose wage increases. They oppose our income tax cuts for every taxpayer. Whatever the issue is, they say no to. And then they have the hide to come in here and say they care about cost of living. They don't care about cost of living if they did. If they did, they would vote Order. for cost of living support, but they have opposed every single measure. We expect that that is the case because while we are supporting Australians, they are cheering against them. I give the call to the honourable member for Gilmore. My question is to the Prime Minister. What cost of living relief can Australians expect from today and how will it make a difference? Have there been attempts to undermine the Albanese Labor government's measures? I give a call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Gilmore for her question. And indeed, from today, there will be a tax cut for every taxpayer, all 13.6 million of them. And we remember full well, full well those opposite, saying they'd opposed it before they knew what it was, then saying they would roll it back, uh, then saying there should be an election on the basis of it, before they then voted for it. And then prior to last week at the CETA conference, said that they'd had their own tax relief plan. Right. But of course, it took a question in Q&A at CETA here, uh, the conference last Thursday before the Leader of the Opposition rolled that back as well. And a bit like, a bit like his, oh, his energy it. plan said, oh, well, oh, it, it, it might be just too hard for an opposition to have a policy that's cost it. It might be just too hard. That's what, that's what he had to say. So not just a tax cut for every taxpayer, but a pay rise for 2.6 million workers yeah. on a world wages today. Because we want Australians to earn more and to keep more of what they earn. That is our commitment. In addition to that, we have our energy price relief, $300 for every household. We have the freezing of PBS medicines. Remember the 60-day dispensing that they said would lead to pharmacies being shut right around the country. In addition to that, we have an extra two weeks of paid parental leave, something that those opposite would never have provided support for. And of course, in addition to that as well, in addition to workers earning more and getting to keep more, they also get a top up in their superannuation from today as well. But over the weekend, I was in Melbourne, uh, in Gellibrand, in Holt, and in Deakin, in Deakin, uh, talking uh, to Order. people like the people I dropped Member in at Captain's Deacon. Choice Fish and Chips. I had a coffee at Culinaria Cafe. I spoke with the workers at this and that community centre. The I met the Deacon owners. Will cease the Good uh, Italian Australians in Pierre's free range meats. I had a barn me at Ms. Barn Me. Had a sausage roll from Paul's Pies. And I got my glasses fixed at I Wear Architects Optometrist, and I thank them for it. 
and I spoke to the pharmacists at the chemist warehouse about cheaper medicines. Order. The member for and Deacon, all, of those, all of those people, in amongst all the discussions the that were held, all of them appreciated the tax cut Order. that they are receiving from today. All of them appreciated the support because they know that from their local member had had their way, they would have got nothing whatsoever. Order. The member for Deakin will cease interjecting, so I'd like to hear from the member for Fairfax. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question goes to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister promised Australians a $275 reduction in household power bills every single year. And yet, starting today, households in New South Wales will pay up to $1,000 more than promised. Queensland up to $948, South Australia up to $958, and in Victoria up to $657 order, order. Members on my right, more the, the than the promised. The will the Prime will Minister come? The, the member will pause. Members on my right have been continually inter interjecting. The member for McEwen and others know that it is highly disorderly, particularly when I'm trying to hear the question. So we'll start the question again. The member for Fairfax has the call, and the clock will be reset. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question goes to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister promised Australians a $275 reduction in household power bills every single year. And yet, starting today, households in New South Wales will pay up to $1,000 more than promised. Queensland up to $948, South Australia up to $958, and in Victoria up to $657 more. Will the Prime Minister come clean and concede his promise will never be met? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And implicit in that question from the member for Fairfax is that if we just have a nuclear reactor <laughs> in every state, in every electorate, sometime in the 2040s, it'll all be fixed. It'll all be fixed. It'll all be fixed. Order. I hope the member for Fairfax has told uh, his constituents in his electorate that the member for Hume deliberately changed the law to conceal from them ahead of the last election a 20 per cent increase, a 20 per cent rise in their electricity bill. I hope that he's apologised to constituents for voting against the energy bill relief that has been, has provided uh, support at a time where we've seen global energy prices increase. But I hope he's told them as well that he was against the cap on coal and gas prices and the rebates for households and businesses. I hope that he's told uh, his constituents as well that his policy is to invest billions, who knows how much, who knows how much, because we haven't seen anything, of, of taxpayer dollars in the most expensive form of new energy. And I hope that as well that he has tried to find a single business leader from the energy sector who has said that his plan stacks up at all. Because this is what the chief executive of Alinta Energy, Jeff Dimmer, has had to say. We don't The member for Fisher, the member for Fairfax, is seeking to call on a point of order, and I'd like to hear his point of order. The member for Fairfax on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is in regards to relevance, because the question had asked the Prime Minister if he will come clean and concede that his promise of a $275 reduction in household power bills resume your, will resume your seat. The Prime Minister was asked a question about a, the manager of our opposition business trying to deal with the point of order. So, if you could assist me, I can assist you. The question was about reduction in power, mentioned the, the price of power, and in particular regarding certain states and the issue of people paying more in the question. And then there was a question about the Prime Minister's commitment and about his promises. So the Prime Minister needs to make sure he's being directly relevant to the question and making sure his answer complies with the standing orders. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I certainly am. But they don't like these days. The modern Liberal Party is against business having voices in their room. It's quite interesting, quite perceptive. Uh, this is what Jeff Dimery had to say. 
We don't have time to get distracted by fringe voices anymore or to get lost in the gunners. We have to work with what Order. we have today. The member for Fair Nuclear the member for is, Fairfax. is kind of like looking for unicorns in the garden. <laughs> unicorns in the garden. Energy Australia have had to say they're committed to Australia's clean energy transformation, reducing emissions as quickly and affordably as possible while maintaining system reliability. Origin. Our primary focus is adding more supply for mature low emissions uh, technologies. AGL, nuclear energy is not part of these plans. AGL's ambition to add 12 gigawatts of new renewable and firming generation by 2035 does not include nuclear energy. Mr Speaker, no one serious. No one serious Order. takes Order. their plans seriously because it's done on the back of a beer coaster without any costing, without any detail and without any substance. The member for Fisher and the member for Fairfax were continually interjecting, interjecting during that answer. I asked and request them to cease. Give the call to the honourable member for Spence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. What cost of living relief kicks in from today? How will the Albanese Labor government's measures help ease pressure on Australians and what approaches were rejected? Give the call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks to the member for Spence, not just for the question, but for being an absolute champion for the working people and families and pensioners in his local community. Speaker, today is a really important day because today, from today, there will be a tax cut for every Australian taxpayer. From today, there will be energy bill relief for every household. There will be a pay rise for millions of workers on awards. There will be cheaper medicines and there will be an extra two weeks of paid parental leave. This is how you deliver cost of living relief, not with expensive nuclear reactors in 15 years' time. The cost of living relief which rolls out today is substantial, it is meaningful and it is responsible. The it is the, the cost of living relief that people need and deserve. It's how we ensure that people earn more and keep more of what they earn because we know people are under pressure and because we know people are under pressure, more help is on the way today. Now, Mr Speaker, we are especially proud of the changes we made to tax to make sure that every Australian taxpayer gets a tax cut and not just some Australians get a tax cut. This is genuine tax reform that lifts thresholds and cuts rates and gets average tax rates down and returns bracket creep at the same time. It means that the average tax cut is $36 a week, Mr Speaker. An average family or an average household with kids, $63 a week. If you're on 120 grand, you get $52 a week. 100 grand, $42 a week. 80 grand, $32 a week. And people on low incomes get a tax cut that those opposite tried to deny them. And here's the difference, Mr Speaker. If they had their way, Order. some taxpayers would be missing out on a tax cut today. And when we changed it to say, no, 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 we don't want just some people already on good incomes to get a tax cut, we want every Australian taxpayer to get a tax cut, the Leader of the Opposition was so filthy about that that he called for an election. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition said that she would absolutely roll them back in government. Now, the Order. Shadow Treasurer said that he'd be taking to the election a policy which is consistent with the old Stage 3. Until last week, as the PM said, the Leader of the Opposition was asked about this and said, yeah, nah, Mr Speaker. <laughs> now, if they had their way, energy bill relief wouldn't be flowing. They voted against it last time. If they had their way, there would be bigger deficits and higher inflation and less help for people who are doing it tough. Now, this side of the House takes a different approach, Mr Speaker. We are rolling out cost of living help. We are fighting inflation. We are turning big Liberal deficits into Labor surpluses, and we're doing that without smashing the economy, Mr Speaker. And that cost of living help that arrives today is substantial, it's meaningful and it's responsible, and it means that we don't just acknowledge that people are under pressure, we're doing something about it. Before we move order, before we move to the next question, I'd just like to do some acknowledgements. I'm pleased to inform the House that in the gallery today is Mrs. Mawara Abdi Bashir Haji, a sitting member of the Federal Parliament of Somalia, also welcoming Lachlan Miller, 
the State Member for Gregory in the Queensland Legislative Assembly and in the Speaker's Visitors Gallery today. I'm pleased to acknowledge two great Queenslanders, Ms Sally Ann Atkinson, the former Lord Mayor of Brisbane, and Ms Janine Walker AM, Chair of the Metro South Hospital and Health Board. Welcome to you all. I give a call to the Honourable Member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This is a question for the Prime Minister. On Friday, it was a year since the Parliamentary Committee tabled 31 recommendations to reform online gambling, unanimously supported across the political spectrum. These recommendations included phasing out online gambling ads. My community is done with gambling ads, and the experts say partial bans don't work. The government has not yet taken any action. When will the government listen to communities and ban ads for online gambling? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Curtin for her question. And indeed, uh, some 88,000 people in the member for Curtin's electorate will get a tax cut today, yeah, yeah. because every single taxpayer will get one. And the member for Curtin knows I was in her electorate uh, a couple of weeks Order. ago Members and talking with left, people uh, whilst the I was there Cook. about the economic challenges but also the opportunities that are there for WA to continue to be such an important part of our growing economy. Uh, the member for Curtin, however, uh, is wrong when she says we haven't done anything, because we have. We've been stepping out support when it comes to uh, things like banning credit cards to gamble online uh, to make a difference and save lives. We have done more in two years to tackle gambling harm than those opposite did in their almost decade in office. Now, the Minister for Communications is working through all 31 recommendations that are in the report, uh, making sure that relevant consultations occur with stakeholders, including harm the reduction Member advocates Cowper. and industry. And we will, we will continue to work through each of the recommendations which are there. But we have already uh, done uh, in establishing uh, BetStop, the National Self Exclusion Register, some 24,000 Australians over the last nine months have, uh, have registered. 80 per cent of those people participating are under the age of 40. We have changed the new minimum classifications uh, for video games with gambling-like content. We have introduced new evidence-based taglines to replace the, replace the old gamble responsibly uh, lines, which were there. And we've introduced nationally consistent staff training. We've forced online wagering companies to send their customers monthly activity statements outlining wins and losses. We've introduced a new voluntary industry funding model, which will allow 30,000 additional people to receive support every year. And we've provided direct funding for specialist financial counselling to support people affected by problem gambling. We'll continue, we'll continue to work uh, on these issues, to work them through. And I'll Happy to continue to work with the member for Curtin in a constructive way. Uh, the member for Curtin always contributes uh, to the policy debate that takes place in this country, and I know uh, that my door and the door of the Minister for Communications, as it is with people across the parliament, is always open uh, because we recognise uh, that what we need to do, what we need to do, is to do more in this area. But we want to make sure that we get it right. Order. The member for O'Connor is continually interjecting, so he's going to cease interjecting. I'll give the call to the member for Chisholm. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. What cost of living relief, including to assist with energy bills, is the Albanese Labor government delivering? How is this different from other approaches? Call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. I'm very pleased to tell her that today, 2.7 million households right across Victoria will begin receiving the $300 energy bill relief, as every household across Australia will, will do, Mr. Speaker. And also today, also today, as well as the tax cuts being delivered, today is also the day that the default market offer and the Victorian market offer come into effect. And when you combine when you combine the government's rebates and the Victorian market offer, that leads on average to a 23 per cent reduction in energy bills for Victorian households, Mr Speaker, today. 23 per cent reduction. Now, of course, Mr Speaker, 
this default market offer that applies from today. It applies on the 1st of July every year, so today is the second anniversary of the 18 per cent increase that the member for Hume hid from the Australian people by changing the law before the last election. The second anniversary of that, which is a, which is a policy we reject. And talking of policies we reject, Mr Speaker, we have had the little thought bubble of expensive nuclear energy from those opposite. All we have seen is the sites, the seven sites released, no costings, no modelling. But, to be fair, always try to give credit where it's due. Try to give credit where it's due. We saw a little, a little more policy the, from the, le from the, the leader of the, the opposition, for, the member for Fairfax. No, no, no. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy will just pause. Order. Members on my right, the member for McNamara will cease interjecting. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, I'm trying to deal just with order in the House. If she could assist me, I'd appreciate it. The member for Fairfax does not need to yell during this answer or any answer. So I'm just going to ask the member for Fairfax for the remainder of question time not to interject anymore. He's had a good go. If he interjects once more time, he'll leave the chamber. Minister for Climate Change and Energy has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. I was just saying that, uh, to be fair to the member for Fairfax, he put out a little more policy on the weekend. We already knew that they were going to have a government-owned instrumentality. They're going to call it the Independent Nuclear Authority. But he also released on the weekend details that there's going to be a second agency, a government business enterprise, uh, to own these nuclear power plants. Now, how would you convince the Australian people that introducing the most expensive form of energy was going to lead to lower bills. He announced the name. It's going to be called Affordable Energy Australia, Mr Speaker. <laughs> In keeping with the previous government's approach, they had the National Energy Guarantee, which didn't guarantee anything. They had the Climate Solutions Fund, which, was, which didn't fund any solutions. They had the underwriting new generation investment, which didn't deliver a dollar or an electron or anything, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is that no amount of spin no amount of utopia-style naming an agency about affordable energy when you're going to introduce the most expensive form of energy will lead to lower bills. We know that experts Order. differ on whether they will increase bills by $200 or $1,000. That's what the experts say, between $200 and $1,000 worth of increases from their expensive nuclear energy policy, Mr Speaker. This sort of spin won't reduce energy prices. What reduces energy prices is real relief Never today, and that's what the Albanese government is delivering, Mr Speaker. What reduces energy prices is concrete, detailed plans like what we saw from AEMO last week, Mr Speaker. That's what reduces energy prices, not expensive reactors in 20 years' time, not Order. spin, not the fake government organisations, but real concluded. energy bill relief. Call to the honourable member for Hume. My question is to the Prime Minister. Under Labor, prices have gone up by nearly 10 per cent. Employee real wages have collapsed by almost 9 per cent. <laughs> Living standards have collapsed by 8 per cent. A typical mortgage holder is around $35,000 a year worse off, and mortgage arrears are at an eight-time high, according to rating agencies Fitch. There is nothing on offer from the government that will reverse this damage. Prime Minister, why are Australian families paying the price for Labor's economic incompetence? Call to the Treasurer. Speaker, even by the extremely low standards of the Shadow Treasurer, to say on the 1st of July, Order. the day. Order. The Treasurer, please. Order. Members on my. No, no. Members on my right. Members are entitled to take a point of order. I'm going to hear from the manager. The Treasurer is a serial offender. You are rightly committed to lifting the standards in this place, and that is not consistent with it. Order. Whoever is interjecting on my right won't be here if they continue that behaviour. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I appreciate what your previous rulings about personal reflections, but to not be able to argue whether someone has brought high or low standards to a question or to debate would be effectively to say you can't have debate. Um, of all the moments of question time to object, what the manager of opposition business has just objected to is just really odd. It's, it, it, you, you can't have normal debate if you can't say whether or not uh, someone's asked something reasonable or whether the standards are, are reasonable or not. 
Look, the manager of opposition does raise a good point about undignified personal tax, which we've been dealing with in question time. But the treasurer simply talking about low standards doesn't fill that category. But I'm going to be making sure that if we stray into territory, which the treasurer knows more than anyone else, um, we will deal with that. So I thank the manager for raising the point, and we're just going to get the treasurer back to the question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to explain to the shadow treasurer the contents of his own question. His question was about uh, the last couple of years and what we are doing to turn it around. And I'm happy to tell the House and I'm happy to explain to the Shadow Treasurer once again Order. what we're doing to help people who are under the pump. And I'll remind the Order. House once again on my left, that when this government Shadow came Treasurer. to office, inflation had a six in front of it. And now quarterly inflation has a three in front of it. When we came to office, there were huge deficits as far as the eye can see. And we turned two of those big Liberal deficits into Labor surpluses. I remind the House Order. that when we came to member, office, member it was Broome. at the end of a decade of deliberate wage stagnation and wage suppression, because low wages growth was a deliberate design feature of their economic policy, Mr Speaker. When we came to office, real wages were falling by 3.4 per cent. They're now growing again, Mr Speaker, and they're not growing again by accident. They're growing again because this is a government which recognises that one of the most effective ways to help people with cost of living is to make it easier for them to earn more and keep more of what they earn. And absolutely central to that, Mr Speaker, and absolutely central to the question that the Shadow Treasurer asked, is the tax cuts that come in from today. And that's why it is uh, unsurprisingly uh, unusual that the Shadow Treasurer has asked a question about living standards on a day where we are easing cost of living pressures at least five different ways, Mr <laughs> Speaker, at least five different ways. Now, we all remember, and I think the Australian people remember too, that when the Prime Minister and I and his Cabinet and his government went into bat for middle Australia and for people on low and middle incomes and we changed the tax cuts and we took a political risk in doing that, we changed those tax yeah, cuts because we wanted to see a tax cut for every Australian taxpayer at the same time as we wanted to see wages growing in our economy. And a combination of that means that Australians are better off than they would have been under those opposite. Because, Mr Speaker, those opposite ran up a trillion dollars in Liberal debt with almost nothing to show for it. They presided over wage stagnation and wage suppression. They skewed the tax cuts to people who were already on high incomes. And we've spent a couple of years trying to clean up the mess that they left us. And I think where that matters very significantly is the fact that real wages were falling when we came to office, they're growing again, and they're a big determinant of living standards in our economy Order. at the same time as we provide this relief. Now, Mr Speaker, I know they're unhappy today because if they had their way, inflation would be even higher and people wouldn't be helping, people wouldn't be getting this cost of living help that they need and deserve. We're proud to be rolling out this cost of Treasurer's living relief, and it starts to roll out from completed. today. The call to the honourable member for Lingiari. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, how is the Albanese Labor government making medicines cheaper for Australians? How is this helping to ease cost of living pressures after a decade of cuts and neglect to health care? The call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Yeah, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Lingiari. She knows this is an important day because every taxpayer in her electorate gets a tax cut today, like a registered nurse working at the Alice Springs Hospital who gets a tax cut of almost $1,600, or about twice what they would have received under the former government's plan, or a hospital orderly at Alice Springs who will get a tax cut of almost $1,200, or more than three times what they would have received under the former government, Mr Speaker. But the member for Lingiari also knows that we need to do more. That's why she promised her electorate at the last election that we would make medicines cheaper. And we've been busy over the last two years delivering on that promise, Mr Speaker. In just our first three months, we slashed the maximum amount that millions of pensioners would pay for their medicines each year by 25 per cent. In our first 12 months, we delivered the biggest cut to the price of medicines in the 75-year history of the PBS. In our first 18 months, 
We finally allowed doctors to prescribe common medicines for chronic conditions for 60 days' supply, not just 30, saving patients time and saving them even more money. Order. And today, Mr the Speaker, we're freezing the price of PBS medicines for up to five years to deliver even more help with the cost of living. Now, already, Mr Speaker, our cheaper medicines policies have saved patients well over $400 million at the chemist, and those savings will grow every single month. But the price freeze alone, Mr Speaker, will save patients almost half a billion dollars more. We've also made more than 200 new and expanded listings to the PBS, Mr Speaker, making sure that Australian patients have access to the best available medicines at affordable prices. And today, Mr Speaker, I'm delighted to announce that we're extending the cancer drug listing Limpasa to early breast cancer patients with a germline BRCA mutation, Mr Speaker. Sarah Powell, who's CEO of Pink Hope, a well-known breast cancer charity, she welcomed this listing and she said this, Mr Speaker. There has long been a need for a targeted medicine to, tr to treat BRCA mutated early breast cancer patients. These patients are usually young and in the prime of their life, contributing to the community, active members of the workforce, and often raising young children and caring for ageing patients too, Mr. Speaker. I'm advised that about 300 patients will benefit from this listing, and without the listing, they'd be paying an extraordinary $69,000 for this uh, wonderful medicine, life-saving medicine, Mr. Speaker. This listing, one of 200 we've made over the past two years, proves again, Mr. Speaker, that cheaper medicines isn't just good for helping with the cost of living; it also saves lives. Yeah. Give the call to the honourable the deputy leader of the opposition. My question is to the prime minister. In three failed budgets, the Prime Minister has failed to tackle inflation with bad decisions and the wrong priorities. Yes. Leading economist Phil O'Donoghue says Australia is the only G10 country where underlying inflation has increased wow. since December. Prime Minister, why are Australian families paying the price for Labor's economic incompetence? Order. The Treasurer will cease, the treasurer will cease rejecting. Order. Order. The Treasurer is going to cease interjecting because the Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I, I thank the, uh, the Deputy Leader uh, for her question that contained a fair bit of uh, imputation, let me say, in, in, uh, in, in, in that question. Well, uh, what we have done is take inflation uh, to almost halve it from what it was that we inherited. Uh, we have, instead of low wage design uh, being a, a policy feature of, uh, of our economic architecture as it was for those opposite, uh, we support workers earning more, uh, and that's why uh, we have supported three uh, wage increases in the minimum wage in our submission to the Fair Work Commission in a row, and we're pleased uh, that from today uh, that will make a substantial difference. But those workers will also get to keep more of what they earn because of what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said uh, was, uh, was, was worthy of uh, not just opposition in the Parliament, where the uh, Deputy Leader said that uh, she would oppose it, uh, regardless of, uh, to, to quote, it, in one of, her, one of her best, one of her best, she said this, we will fight this legislation in the parliament. We don't even know what it will look like. <laughs> like you can't make it up, Mr Speaker. When this legislation hits the parliament, we will fight it. We will fight it all the way. I'm digging him along with my colleagues and our leader, Peter Dutton, to fight this fight really, really hard. <laughs> that was before she voted for it. <laughs> that was be just before she voted for it, Mr Speaker. But what they have opposite, they've got a tax policy designed to roll back tax cuts. They've got an IR policy designed to reduce wages. They've got a fiscal strategy designed to rack up debt. They've got a housing policy designed to wreck super. They've got a health policy designed to destroy Medicare. And they've got a nuclear reactor plan 
designed to jack up power prices. That's the alternative. The difference in our approaches is very clear. Earn more and keep more of what you earn under this side, or work longer for less over there. Pushing wages up on this side or holding them down over there. Building more homes all over Australia or wrecking the superannuation system over there. And cheaper, cleaner energy, which is what we want, or more expensive nuclear reactors sometime in the 2040s, which is what they want. Call to the honourable member for Robertson. Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Minister for Social Services. How is the Albanese Labor government supporting families who have recently welcomed a new baby? And what cost of living relief is being rolled out to Australian families from today? And are there any risks to this support? I'm going to call to the Minister for Social Services. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Robinson for that question. And he knows, as we all do, that the arrival of a new baby is a very special time for uh, a family. It's a time when parents require support to step back from paid work so Order. they can focus on caring for their newborn. And we also know it's a time that can place extra pressure on the family budget. And that's why Labor's investment in paid parental leave is so critical. It provides families with extra support so they can focus on what's important to them. Now, from today, families are eligible for two extra weeks of paid parental leave as the government scheme increases from 20 to 22 weeks. This means over the course of their leave, families will now receive $20,150 to help them take time off work and cover some of the costs that come with a new baby. And of course, Mr Speaker, we're not stopping there. We are further expanding the scheme to 26 weeks and we will legislate superannuation on top of this. Now, our changes have been widely welcomed by families and, of course, by advocates. The Parenthood, a leading parent advocacy group, said significant improvement after no meaningful change to the policy after a decade is welcome. And, of course, Playgroups Australia said it's such a relief to see this policy finally come to fruition in Australia. Now, also from today, around 1.3 million low- to middle-income families will receive some extra relief with a boost to their rate of family tax benefit. And in addition, every household will see their power bill cut by $300, and every Australian will benefit from a freeze on their cost of PBS medicines. Now, Mr Speaker, this is how you deliver cost of living relief, not by pushing up power prices with expensive nuclear reactors. Now, those opposite do pose a risk to Australian families, not only the through Robert their expensive, risky nuclear folly, but also their track record of, of course, cutting family payments through imposing year-on-year -year indexation freezes when they were last in government. And of course they tried to deny families to be able to take both their government and paid parental leave, calling them double dippers. Well, it's only this side of politics that has a plan to deliver responsible and meaningful cost of living relief now, including, of course, tax cuts to every single Australian taxpayer starting from today. And of course, this will make a real difference to the 13.6 million taxpayers we're giving them relief right now. This is good news for Australian families, and uh, this is good news for Australian taxpayers. Yeah. Could, give the call to the Honourable the Manager of Opposition Business. I just ask the Minister to table the document she is reading from. Yeah. Was order, order. No, uh, or, Order. The Minister for Home Affairs is now warned. Completely inappropriate statement. Was the, manager, was the minister reading from confidential documents? Order. Give a call to the honour, the deputy leader of the op, the deputy leader of the opposition. That's disrespectful as well. Give a call to the honourable the member for New England. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In light of the disgraceful desecration of the Australian War Memorial and then in the last couple of nights uh, the Vietnam War Memorial and the Korea Memorial, 
what actions are you taking to condemn this and what actions are you taking to ensure that this does not happen again? The call to the Honourable the Prime Minister. I thank the member for his question and I certainly condemn the criminal acts that have occurred at the Australian War Memorial and also on the Vietnam War Memorial, the Korean War Memorial and other war memorials as well uh, that have occurred in places like, uh, like Sydney. Uh, I don't know what goes through someone's head in thinking that a cause, any cause, is advanced by the desecration of what are sacred sites here in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Our veterans and men and women who wear our uniform deserve our respect. And the reason why we have those memorials is to enable Australians of different generations to learn from it, to go and to show respect and to honour those who have sacrificed their lives uh, on behalf of us for our freedom, our democratic values and our way of life. The Governor-General, in her speech earlier uh, today in the Members' Hall, spoke about the fact that from the Prime Minister's office, when the doors are open with the design of this building, you see right through the Members' Hall, through the Great Hall, through the entrance of Parliament House, past Parliament House to the Australian War Memorial. That is not by accident. That is because the decisions which people make in high office, in particular governments make, to send our men and women into danger, we must always think about uh, the impact that that has on those who undertake their duty on our behalf. So I just say that of all, and there have been a range of frankly, uh, idiotic criminal actions uh, while uh, the uh, Middle East conflict has been going on. Uh, it is one thing, and, and there should be full prosecution about the denigration of officers and the denigration of other uh, public buildings, yeah, yeah. but nothing, nothing is as bad as the desecration of those memorials, and I thank the member uh, for his question, and I hope sincerely that these people who are responsible are found, they get the full force of the law, and they get the book thrown at them. Yeah. And they get exposed publicly as well for who they are. We know what they are. They're unworthy, unworthy of uh, having any respect and any leniency as a result of their own actions. Yeah. Indulgence, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. On indulgence, I join with the Prime Minister in uh, the condemnation of these senseless acts. I thank the member for New England for the question and uh, understand and acknowledge the very real concern he has, like every decent Australian has, about the scenes and what we've seen playing out, not just at the War Memorial sites, but also outside members of Parliament's offices, including the Prime Minister's office, what we've seen uh, outside Jewish schools, uh, what we've seen on university campuses and across society where these acts of anti-Semitism have taken place. Uh, the River to the Sea, as the Prime Minister has noted before in this chamber, uh, is an abomination. And that comment is all about the elimination of a race of people. And what the Jewish community is going through in our country at the moment is completely and utterly unacceptable. And they rightly stand condemned, uh, the people who have committed these offences and, as the Prime Minister rightly points out, uh, unfortunately there hasn't been arrests that have taken place so far and I hope that uh, the police can double down on their efforts to identify these people and to allow a very clear message to be sent to those of a similar mind that these acts are not to be condoned in our society. Those men and women, the 103,000 who have lost their lives serving our nation, have done so for our lifestyle to be maintained and for our life in this country to continue as it is today. And we don't do their memory any service 
by what we've seen at the War Memorial, whether it's the Australian War Memorial, whether it is uh, any commemoration of the life and sacrifice of the men and women of the Australian Defence Force, and they rightly stand condemned for these actions, uh, and we hope that they shall not be repeated. Yeah. The call to member for Benelong. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. How is the Albanese Labor government supporting Australia's 2.5 million small businesses, and what risky alternatives could undermine this support? Give the call to the Minister for Housing, the Minister for Homelessness and the Minister for Small Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I do want to thank our terrific member for Ben Long for yeah. that important question, because he understands that small businesses are important to our nation's economy. Indeed, they're at the heart of the nation's economy and now contribute over half a trillion dollars to the nation's economy each and every year. They're also at the heart of the government's decision-making. And that's why, from today, July 1, we are providing relief for small businesses, Mr Speaker. As of today, we've abolished 457 nuisance tariffs, cutting compliance costs, reducing red tape, boosting productivity and making it easier for businesses to do business. We're extending the $20,000 instant asset write-off, making it easier for small businesses to invest and grow, Mr Speaker. This is an extension of the support that passed the parliament last week for the last financial year, Mr Speaker. And of course, those opposite delayed this important support for small businesses. They dragged it out to the last minute and caused uncertainty for small businesses, Mr Speaker. After months of delay, I certainly hope that they're quicker with this $20,000 instant asset write-off extension, Mr Speaker. It's the certainty, of course, Order. that Labor is providing with our $640 million uh, support for small businesses as part of the budget. Practical and targeted support, Mr Speaker, all laid out in our small business budget statement. And of course, as part of that is energy bill relief, Mr Speaker. We know, of course, that energy bill relief is being rolled out to households, but it's also being rolled out to small businesses. As it was last year, of course, up to $650 for each small business, which of course those opposite voted against, Mr Speaker. They voted against higher energy prices for small business last year, and this year we're providing $325 for around a million small businesses around the country in energy bill relief. Providing energy bill relief and a renewable energy future made in Australia is, of course, how you deliver real cost of living relief for small businesses, not by pushing up energy prices with nuclear reactors, Mr Speaker. Those opposite voted against the energy bill relief, as I said, and now, of course, they want to push up small businesses' power prices with nuclear reactors. They want to actually make the energy bills of small businesses go nuclear, Mr Speaker. But small businesses are smart. They're innovative. But they do understand about nuclear power, Mr Speaker. They understand that it's too expensive, that it will take too long. And of course, our government will continue to support small businesses. And we're doing that with the energy bill relief. We're doing it with the instant asset write-off. And importantly, we're also providing an extension of mental health and financial counselling support, around $10 million for small businesses. And we, of course, are legislating payment times that hopefully will be supported in the Senate this week, improving payment times of big businesses to small business. Give the call to the honourable member for Fowler. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the government one-off $300 rebate that you claim would help all Australians with their energy bills starts today. CPI is still around 4 per cent, according to the ABS. We know the rebate and tax cuts your government announced will not be enough to pay for the increase in food, energy, petrol price, rents and housing needs, which many families in Fowler are facing. Will you guarantee that struggling families in Western Sydney won't go backwards with the cost of living from today with your, gov with your government's announcements? The call to the Prime Minister. Uh, I thank the member for Fowler for her question. I'm sure that uh, she, she would welcome uh, the support for the 62,000 taxpayers in her electorate who will get a tax cut today. today. Now, I'm asked, will that make them go forward or back? Uh, that's extra cash in their pockets, yeah. 62000 yeah. And for an electorate like Fowler, which has far less than, the national, than my electorate, for example, on the top, top tax rate and far more uh, who earn less than $45,000 a year— Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition 
does not need to interject with those sorts of comments. The Prime Minister has been directly relevant in mentioning the member's electorate. The, the members... deputy, deputy Leader is warned and the Prime Minister will continue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the decision that we made to change the tax cuts and their direction from Liberals' tax cuts that would have seen people miss out to Labor's tax cuts would directly impact in a positive way Order. members of her electorate. Directly. Just as uh, those uh, who every single household will benefit uh, from the $300 reduction. Every small business in her electorate will benefit from $325 reduction, just like anyone who has a child uh, on the way will benefit uh, from the additional two weeks paid parental leave, uh, just like all those uh, people, particularly uh, the elderly people in her electorate, who rely upon uh, PBS medicines will benefit directly from what we're doing of the, the one-year freeze for everyone, but a five-year freeze for uh, people on, uh, on pensions and on those fixed, uh, fixed incomes. They will all benefit from that. In addition to that, every single uh, worker will benefit from the increase in superannuation. All of that, uh, higher wages, lower taxes, will benefit uh, people in her electorate, and all of them were opposed by those opposite. So I'm sure uh, the member for Fowler, the member for Fowler as well, uh, will. I, I'm sure uh, she would support the other changes that we have in mind as well, uh, such as that are stuck in the Senate, like the additional money uh, for housing uh, that remains there, like uh, the plan that we have, so that. Uh, which will only impact those people who have three million dollars in super. I don't think there's, there's huge numbers of the electorate of Fowler. Uh, they're much more likely to be in my electorate or the electorate of Wentworth or others uh, to be impacted there. So I'm sure member for that the member for Fowler uh, will support the government's initiatives because they are delivering Order. for her electorate. Time has concluded. The call to the member for Hunter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering cost of living relief to regional Australians? What has been the response? I call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I, can I thank the member for Hunter very much for that question and particularly acknowledge the great work that he does as the member for Hunter, but also championing those of us who live in regions right the way across this parliament. Because, of course, as members of regional Australia, we know that our number one priority is delivering cost of living relief for every Australian, particularly those who are living in our regions. We do understand that people in our communities are under pressure, and we do understand that some of them are doing it really tough. We're working hard to deliver that cost of living relief to ensure Australians, particularly in, their re in the regions, can earn more and keep more of what they earn. That is why, from today, every single taxpayer across regional Australia is receiving a tax cut. A truckie in the Pilbara, earning $77,000, is getting a tax cut of $1,604. A construction worker in the Hunter, earning $110,000, is getting a tax cut of $2,429, and an apprentice in Gippsland earning $53,000 is receiving a tax cut of $1,000. Tax cuts that help regional Australians keep more of what they earn. And of course, also from today, 2.6 million Australians on award wages are getting another pay rise backed in by this side of the House. From today, we are freezing the cost of medicines on the pharmaceutical benefits schemes, and we all know that many people, many older people, rely significantly on medicines, and that is a significant cost of living relief for them. And of course, from today, our energy bill relief begins. $300 on power bill relief for every regional household and $325 for regional small businesses. And of course, when it comes to infrastructure and regional investment, 
We have increased funding across the country, and in particular, when I acknowledge the local government members that are here, we are increasing roads to recovery funding from $500 million to $1 billion, which means that every single local council across Australia, not just some, will have more money to spend on our local roads, and that reduces pressure on ratepayers, something that those opposite didn't do and something that those opposite frankly put more pressure on councils through their freezing of financial assistance grants. We know that there is more to do, which is why we are working every single day to make life better for regional Australia. That is how you deliver cost of living relief, not by pushing up power prices with expensive nuclear reactors. The opposition have nothing, of, nothing positive to offer. They are standing continuously in the way of costing, cost of living relief for Australians. <laughs> they want to build nothing, help no one, and take our country nowhere. Call to the manager of opposition business. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's statements in this place last week concerning Senator Payman. When will the Prime Minister expel Senator Payman from the Labor caucus for her disgraceful conduct? and her endorsement of the anti-Semitic chant from the river to the sea. Order. Order. There is far, the Minister for Infrastructure. I need to hear the Deputy Leader of the House on the point of order. Thank you, Speaker. A practice at page 553 makes it very clear there has been a long-standing convention that the Prime Minister and Ministers cannot be asked questions about the party room. So I'm just going to ask the manager to rephrase that question to make sure it's within standing orders regarding the Prime Minister's responsibilities. Well, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, the question referred directly to the Prime Minister's comments he made in this House last week about Senator Payman. And as the Leader of the House himself argued on 2 February 2021, it should be open to the opposition to interrogate comments made by the Prime Minister. Yep. As long as the question is relaxed. Order. As long as, as long as the Members on my right, as long as the question contains a statement that the Prime Minister has made, it is in within. Uh, re restate the question again, Manager, so the House can assist, so I can assist in directing the question. And as long as it's in within the standing orders regarding a statement the Prime Minister has made, either through the media or through the House, the question will be in order. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's statements in this place last week concerning Senator Payman. When will the Prime Minister expel Senator Payman from the Labor caucus for her disgraceful conduct and her endorsement of the anti-Semitic chant from the river to the sea? A very clear, simple question. I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, page 553 of practice makes clear that you can't ask, and the whole question has previously been ruled out as what practice says, when the question is itself about party matters. The question, there's a, a reference to a statement where we hear nothing other than the statement being What's there, the statement? but the entire question itself is about membership of a party, and therefore it is squarely ruled out under practice, squarely. Yeah. We're trying to deal with this to get the question within the standing orders, so it, order Questions like this have been approved before and have been allowed before. It would assist to make sure it's in with precedent to make sure that perhaps a, a reference to the statement, um, because the Prime Minister order the Prime Minister made obviously a lot of statements last week. So normally when a question is about I refer to the article where the Prime Minister said or on the date or the time. So obviously the Prime Minister is able to be uh, correct in his answer. So I'll give a I'll give you another shot, but I'm just telling you, in light of what I've said, don't read the same question out again because it'll be ruled out and we will go straight to the next question. Mr. <sighs> yeah, the, uh, well, the member for Kennedy on this point of order, we're just going to keep things moving. But we'll... The House is right in what he said, but this concerns where you sit in this parliament. That's a lot different than party membership. And I, I think it, the question is proper. I thank the member for Kennedy for his intervention and thoughts. Just going to make sure that you refer to this, the, the statement the Prime Minister made, because otherwise it's, it would not be reasonable for a minister to know every single statement that they said regarding the matter. 
Okay. My question is to the Prime Minister, who last week said in this House, I met with Senator Payman earlier today. She will not be attending the Labor caucus for the rest of this session. Since that time, she has uh, again reiterated uh, her support for the anti-Semitic chant from the river to the sea. What action will the Prime Minister take consistent with the courage shown by previous Labor Prime Ministers, or will he continue to be weak? Order. No. We've order. No. No. We're going to deal. We're going to deal with this just as we've been consistent with reflections on members and dignity of the house, as the manager himself has raised in May. But I'll hear from the leader of the house. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you've previously given instructions to the house at the request of the manager of opposition business that if reflections like that were made, you would be ruling out questions. Yeah. And given that we had a point of order about something the Treasurer had said in his answer, we're going order to, to get the question through, Leader of the Opposition, I'm going to ask the manager to withdraw the last part and order. The manager is going to withdraw the last part and then the Prime Minister is going to get the call. Uh, I withdraw the last part, Mr Speaker. I thank the manager. The Prime Minister now has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'll make uh, a few points. Uh, one is that from the river to the sea is a statement that has been used by both supporters of Israel and supporters of Palestine who support a single state. A single state. Order. Members it's on just my a left fact. will cease. The leader of the, op the, the leader of the opposition will the, and the leader of the opposition will cease interjecting. Order. We're going to handle this with decorum and respect. Members on my right will cease. The prime minister is going to be heard in silence, just as the manager was given silence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make in terms of. Uh, social harmony is that it is important that we take temperature down in this debate, not seek, not seek to inflame it. We just had a question earlier on about some of the activity that I condemn. That I condemn. I condemn unequivocally the use of the phrase "from the river to the sea" because it speaks about a single state, a single state. The fact, is, the fact is that the government's position is very clear. We support a two-state solution, and last week in the Senate Order. we moved an amendment which said this, the need for the Senate to recognise the state of Palestine as a part of a peace process in support of a two-state solution and a just and enduring peace. Our position is clear. We support the proposal by President Biden and the United States for a peaceful resolution. We support hostages being released. We support civilians being protected. We continue to call for increased humanitarian aid. We continue to argue that every single innocent life matters, whether Israeli or Palestinian. By her own actions, Senator Payman has placed herself outside the privilege that comes with participating in the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party caucus, and I informed here her of that yesterday. Order. The member for Bowman is now warned. We'll hear from the member for Fremantle. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. What is the Albanese Labor government doing to support early childhood educators and to support families in using early childhood education and care, and what obstacles have been overcome? The call to the Minister for Education. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And can I thank my friend, the fantastic member for Fremantle, for his question. Today, every Aussie taxpayer gets a tax cut. Teachers, nurses, truckies, tradies, and that also includes childcare workers. A childcare worker on, say, $40,000 a year today gets a tax cut 
of $654. Under the Liberals, if they'd won the last election, that same childcare worker would have got nothing. Zero. And it's just one example of the difference between the Labor Party and the Liberal Party. Under us, every childcare worker who pays tax gets a tax cut. Under the Liberals, some of those childcare workers would have got nothing. And it's a similar story when it comes to pay rises. Two and a half million Aussies on awards today get a pay rise, including childcare workers. For a childcare worker on the award wage, they'll get a pay rise of about $2,000 a year. That's on top of pay rises this time last year and the year before that. Pay rises we support, pay rises the Liberal Party oppose. Pay rises you might remember the Liberal Party described as reckless. And today is another reason to celebrate. Today is one year since our cheaper childcare laws came into effect. Remember, this is the policy that the Liberal Party described, quote unquote, as a disgrace. Now, this is the policy that has cut the cost of childcare for more than one million Australian families. The Liberal Party described that as a disgrace. If you're a family on a combined income of, say, 120 grand, you've got one child in care three days a week, this has cut the cost of your childcare, reduced the cost that you would have to otherwise pay by about $2,000 because of our cheaper childcare laws. $2,000 less in the Order. last year on my than left. you would otherwise have to pay. And the Liberal Party think that's a disgrace. And that same family gets a tax cut today of about $2,000. That's real cost of living relief. The biggest childcare provider in the country, Good Start, recently released a report that shows out-of-pocket costs have gone down and the people that have benefited the most from this are families on low and middle incomes. That's how you deliver real cost of living relief, not by jacking up electricity prices with expensive nuclear reactors. Order. Tax cuts, pay rises and cheaper childcare. Under the Liberal Party, none of these things would have happened. Under the Liberal Party, Australians would have earned less and would pay more Order. tax. Under the Albanese Labor government, Australians are earning more and keeping more of what they earn. Give the call to the honourable member for Griffith. Question to the Prime Minister. New analysis by the Parliamentary Budget Office shows that over the next decade, the federal government will hand over $165 billion in tax handouts to property investors in the form of negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount. 67 per cent of the benefit will go to the top 20 per cent of earners, while only 14 per cent will go to the bottom 50 per cent of earners. Can the Prime Minister explain why Labor believes this is a good thing? Call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the Honourable Member for the question about tax reform and about housing. Uh, I'll tell you what Labor believes. Uh, Labor believes that the best way to deal with the issues in the housing market is to build more homes. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, to the great credit of the Housing Minister, Order. the great Members credit to the left. Housing Minister, uh, we're alloc we've allocated an extra $32 billion to building more homes in our communities and in our economy including $6 billion Member in the most recent budget. Now, Mr Speaker, as I said the other day, as the Minister for Housing said the other day, if the Greens political party really wanted to solve the issues in the housing market, they'd vote to do that. They would vote for more homes. They would vote for us to build more homes. And that shameful vote last week, which made it very difficult to work out where the Liberal Party begins and ends and where the Greens party it's begins and ends on housing, uh, really was a demonstration, I think, of the Greens political party's real priorities here. And as I said last week, as I'm happy to say again, the Greens will always put a much higher premium on fighting the Labor Party than fighting for more housing Order. for people to live in. The Treasurer will pause. The member for Griffith on a point of order. On relevance, Speaker, we're over a minute into the question. The Treasurer has not mentioned negative gearing or the capital gains tax once. That was the entire point of the question. It was a tight question, and if he's not capable of answering, he should sit down. OK. Order. Members on my left, the member for Griffith is entitled to raise a point of order on relevance, just like any other member is entitled. The question at the end was, can he explain why the government believes this is a good thing? So that's by its very nature isn't 
a tight question. So if it was for a fact or a figure or a policy topic, yes. But when you add a tagline into the question like this, just so all members know, the question is opened up to a broad intention. But the Treasurer has had a, a, um, a time to do some compare and contrast, and he can answer how he sees fit when he thinks, is it a good thing or bad thing, what you've suggested. The, Prime Minister, uh, the, Depu the Treasurer has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. The only thing more pathetic than the point of order was to hear the Shadow Treasurer chirping away without a question. <laughs> the Shadow Treasurer chirping away without a question over there. He can't get a question, but he's prepared to chirp away when the member for Griffith asks his question. Now, the reason why this is relevant, order. Mr Speaker, the reason why building more homes and building more supply and our $32 billion investment is so important is because the Greens' political party had an opportunity in the Senate last week to vote for tax changes which would incentivise more homes in our communities, tens of thousands of homes. And the point that I'm making is if the member for Griffith wants to use the tax system to make the housing sector fairer for young people and homeless people and renters, then he would have voted that way in the Senate or his colleagues would have voted that way in the Senate. Our priority when it comes to tax reform and housing is to incentivise more rental properties because for as long as there aren't enough homes in our communities, rents will be too high. Now, Mr Speaker, the other important point about rents is that we have now provided in two consecutive budgets two increases to Commonwealth rent assistance. And rents are still too high and they're growing too fast. In the most recent monthly indicator, the annual price growth uh, was rental growth was 7.4 per cent. It would have been 9.3 per cent without our changes to Commonwealth rent assistance. So we acknowledge that rents are too high, we acknowledge that more homes need to be built. We're providing that cost Commonwealth rent assistance increase at the same time as we're trying to build more homes. Now, Mr Speaker, last week in the Senate, the Greens voted for fewer homes and higher rents and more homelessness. If they really cared about housing, they would vote with Labor rather than vote with the Conservatives. When the House comes to order, we'll hear from the Honourable Member. For Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Early Childhood Education. How is the Albanese Labor government helping Australian families with the cost of living, including in early childhood education and care? Great question. I give a call to the Minister for Early Childhood Education and the Minister for Youth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Boothby for her question and for her ongoing and relentless advocacy for families and children in Boothby. Now, Mr Speaker, even before we took office in 2022, we knew that the cost of early childhood education and care was placing pressure on families, that it was often cited as the reason that women and, and primary caregivers uh, offer either, either delayed returning to work or w weren't able to take on extra hours to, of work, weren't able to go back to study if they so wished. And that's why this Prime Minister went to the election with a policy to lower the cost of early childhood education and care for over one million Australian families. Now, Mr Speaker, today marks one year, one year since our cheaper childcare legislation came into effect. The legislation that we enacted within our first six months of being in office. And the ACCC has found that due to those reforms, due to Labor's reforms in decreasing the cost of early childhood education and care, out-of-pocket expenses for centre-based daycare are down by 11%. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean in real terms? And the Minister for Education gave a great example for that, and one that is worth repeating in this place. For a family with an income of $120,000 and one child in care for three days a week, these reforms mean that they have paid $2,140 less in early learning fees. Now, in addition to that, from today, from today that family will also get a tax cut a tax cut of around $2,679 as well. And there's a raft of other measures for, uh, for assisting with the cost of living that this government uh, has enacted as of today. Energy bill relief, cheaper medicines, more paid parental leave. 
Mr Speaker, if you want to look at how you deliver real cost of living relief, look at this side of the House. Mm -hmm. Look at the things that we're doing, putting pressure down on the cost of living whilst not putting pressure to increase inflation. That's what we've been doing here, because that's how you deliver real cost of living relief. You don't do it. Order. You don't deliver real cost of living relief by jacking up uh, power prices with some fantasy of nuclear energy in the never-never. Now, Mr Speaker, the reforms that I've spoken about here today on early childhood education and care are a critical first step in achieving our vision of a universal early childhood education and care system, one that's affordable, one that's accessible and one that's inclusive. Give the call to the member for Durack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Families in my Durack community are at breaking point. Joshua, age 16, has told ABC News, and I quote, sometimes we're really scraping just to pay the bills and afford food for the family. Mum actually quite often misses out on dinner so that there's actually a portion size suitable for the rest of the family the following night. Prime Minister, why are Australian families paying the price for Labor's economic incompetence? The call to the Prime Minister. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for her question, and I, I hope that she's uh, told Joshua uh, in her electorate uh, that she voted against energy price relief. Uh, that one assumes uh, that will have occurred. Uh, that uh, if, 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 if Joshua if Joshua works Order. and is a taxpayer, I hope that she's told him that. Uh, that she actually supports the old stage three tax cuts because that's what that's what the leader of the opposition said just in just in February, not that long ago. Do we walk away from the principles of stage three? Absolutely not. So I assume that she tells Joshua if he earns under forty five thousand dollars that he shouldn't get a tax cut today. I assume uh, that. Uh, well, a, a, a lot of people. I don't know Josh, but the the member does. Neither does the um, member. And I, 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 I assume, I assume. I was working when I was 16, uh, certainly, and so are lots of Australians. And that's part of the point. Part of the Order. point here is lab. that a whole lot of part-time workers will now get a tax cut. Right. And one of the reasons why Treasury estimated Order. that our design of the tax cuts would increase workforce participation. Is just that. Is just that. So it's designed to provide that forest. cost of living support at the same time as not putting pressure on inflation. Uh, so I certainly uh, wish Josh well. I know that uh, families, uh, many of them, are, uh, are doing it uh, really tough. But they would have done it tougher if the inflation rate was the same as the one that we inherited, which was six per cent. So we are. Increasing wages, having tax cuts, energy bill relief, freeze on medicines, uh, making a substantial difference with all these practical measures, all practical moves opposed by those opposite and voted against by the member for Durack. Give a call to the honourable member for Canberra. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Sport. How is the Albanese Labor government working for older Australians and the people who care for them after a decade of neglect? Yeah. I call to the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister for Sport. Um, I thank the member for, Ca for Canberra for her question and how diligently she represents the people of Canberra, particularly the 78,000 taxpayers in her electorate of Canberra who will be receiving a tax cut today. And from day one in government, Labor has been working to deliver our promise to older Australians and the people who care for them. <laughs> our promise to put nurses back into nursing homes, our promise to make sure older people have the quality care that they need and that they deserve, our promise to hold providers to account and mandate transparency across the sector, our promise to deliver a hard-earned pay rise to our dedicated aged care workers. And we are delivering on our promises. That's Today right. I can share that Australia has achieved another aged care milestone. Right now there, are just, there is a registered nurse on site in aged care 99 per cent of the time across the country in Australia. 
That's right. 99 per cent of the time across the country, a nurse is on duty in an aged care facility, and older Australians are receiving an additional 3.6 million minutes of care every single day Excellent. as a result. There has been a reduction in physical restraints. There has been a reduction in the number of falls. There has been a reduction in unplanned weight loss, in antipsychotics and polypharmacy, and in pressure injuries. We are also seeing improvements in our star ratings data with fewer one and two rated star, star rated facilities and more four and five star rated facilities. And workers are being paid more than they ever have before after a 15 per cent increase to award wage minimums. Under the Albanese government, registered nurses are now taking home an additional $196 every single week or more than $10,000 per year. Personal care workers are taking an additional $141 per week home or $7,300 every single year. Mm -hmm. I have heard from aged care workers across the country about the hugely positive changes that these are having, both on the quality of care that they are able to deliver to the aged care residents that they love and on the cost of living pressures that they are facing in their own households. I've heard from Phoenicia, I've heard from Chinatsu, I've heard from Dawn, I've heard from Sue, from Jocelyn, from Donna and Michelle, just a handful of the 250,000 aged care workers who have benefited from a life-changing increase to their minimum award wages funded by the Albanese government. And the pay rise is just the start of our work to support these valuable workers starting today. We are also giving them a tax cut. We're freezing their PBS medicine costs today. We are delivering a $300 power relief today. We are increasing paid parental leave today. That is how you deliver cost of living relief, not by pushing up the power prices by nuclear reactors. Yeah, yeah. Give the call to the honourable member for River Arena. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Capital Brewing Co is a local success story, but under the Albanese Labor government it is suffering from skyrocketing costs. Co-founder and Managing Director Lawrence Kane stated, quote, Our costs have risen almost out of control. Our electricity bill has gone from $4,500 a month to almost $12,000 a month over the last two years. He said that yesterday. Prime Minister, why are regional small businesses paying the price for Labor's economic incompetence? Order. Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for his question. I assume he's referring to Capital Brewing here in Canberra. So. Order. <laughs> thank, thank you for that clarification, <laughs> member, for, member for Riverina. Uh, they produce a very fine product. I, I, uh, I, I give them that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, we're dealing with uh, energy price relief, not just for individuals, but for small businesses, uh, but for uh, those opposite, for those opposite who've opposed the tax cuts for everyone who works at Capital Brewing, uh, who have uh, opposed uh, the other support, including, one would assume, the lower wages. Many of the people at Capital Brewing will be on uh, low wages, award wages. Uh, they're likely to benefit uh, from uh, the increase in wages that we see. Member and that's a positive. Gray is interjecting, not from his seat. Prime Minister has the call. And that's a positive thing as well. But I hope that the member for Riverina, if he uh, goes down uh, to the Capital Brewing uh, joint just down the road that he, he, he tells me he's uh, familiar with, I hope that he tells him. It'll be OK, because we'll have a nuclear reactor somewhere in 2040. <laughs> that, that'll fix it. Call to the Honourable Member for Haslock. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Financial Services. How is the Albanese Labor government strengthening the superannuation system so that Australians can meet the cost of living needs and retire with dignity? Give a call to the Assistant Treasurer and the Minister for Order. Members on my left, I haven't called the minister yet. Minister for Financial Services and the Assistant Treasurer has the call. Uh, thanks so much, Speaker. Can I thank the fantastic member for Hasluck for her question and just note that because of her great advocacy, there are 84,000 taxpayers in her electorate who are going to be better off this week. 
Speaker, there are four things that Parliament needs to know about today. The first thing is that wages are up. The second thing is that super's up. The third thing is that taxes are down. And the fourth thing is that this mob over there opposed every single one of those things. Wages are up, and I, can I say, can I say, Mr. Order. Speaker, left, this is a good Batten. story because of the strong leadership of the Prime Minister, the economic management of the Treasurer, the fantastic guidance of the Industrial Relations Minister. An Australian worker on minimum wages today will be $33 a week better off, in addition to their tax cut. Bigger tax Order. cut, better wages, every single one of them opposed by that mob opposite. But can I focus on the superannuation, Deputy Speaker, because this week, because this Order. week superannuation is going we'll to increase by 0.5 per cent. And I want members to contemplate the situation of a worker who starts work in a grocery store or supermarket today. That worker need do nothing more but stay in that same job for the, for the remainder of their years until retirement and they will be $20,000 better off. I'll repeat that. Because of the 0.5 per cent increase in their superannuation this week, that worker will be $20,000 a year better off in retirement. And it's because of the strength of our superannuation system. You know, Deputy Speaker, it's often opposed by those members opposite, but an average Australian is retiring today with $20,000 in their superannuation, $20,000 to retire on, making a monumental and meaningful difference to their retirement. And the secret source behind our superannuation system is the preservation of savings, something that that mob over there oppose. But every year, every eight years, a worker's superannuation is doubling. Every eight years, a worker's superannuation Order. is doubling. Now, I concede the... that this is powered by compound interest, not nuclear fission, but it is making a real economic difference to our country and to those workers. Order. On top of these initiatives, Mr. Speaker, superannuation on paid parental leave. Superannuation on paid parental leave is going to make a monumental difference. $2,400 additional retirement savings for those workers. Every single one of these things opposed by Minister's that mob officer. time has concluded. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Order. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Scoop. Have you got another question, Angus? <laughs> on, on that basis, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. <laughs>